Hello again, everyone. I'm Chris Kreitcho. This is Dan Freeman. You can see my hands waving around because guess what? We changed the camera setup again. <laughs> professional YouTubers. Not professional and not YouTubers. But we are back to talk, as promised yesterday, through a bit of the remaining parts that we haven't covered for Glint and the how do we get from handlebars templates to TypeScript story. Today, talking a bit about literally the, like, what a, wait, we, we keep talking about how we present things to TypeScript, but how do we actually present things to TypeScript? So, Dan, any comments or shall we just dive in? I don't think so. I think let's just jump in and see where we get to. Sweet. Um, All right. Let's see oh, here. you're going to have to zoom. Zoom, zoom. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not actually talking about text yet, but yeah, that's probably oh, that's fair. better. That's fair. Um, so, yeah, before we actually do look at code, I think probably the place that it makes sense to talk a little bit in the abstract is about what the TypeScript compiler API looks like. And, <laughs> um, I you would be forgiven. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think most people do. Um, you'd be forgiven for thinking, OK, there's probably like a compiler API. And if you think about it a little bit harder, you might say, OK, well, the things the CLI has to do are pretty different from the kinds of things that the language server has to do. So there might be separate APIs for those two things. And that is true. Um, that's We can start from that point. But in fact, the things the CLI does, the CLI presents itself as like a single thing. And it's you're invoking TypeScript, and you pass some flags that maybe tweak the behavior. But at the end of the day, it's just TypeScript. But if you look at the compiler API, and this is not a knock on the TypeScript team. Like This has evolved over more than a decade, I think, of yeah. sort of organic development. But there is not a single compiler API for doing the things that the TypeScript CLI does. There are half a dozen, give or take. <laughs> um, there is a different API for doing a single pass check of a single project than there is for doing a watch check of a single project. And depending on whether or not the incremental flag is set, you have to set those two things up completely different ways. And then when you enter things like build mode into the story, that basically doubles all of the possible combinations you can have. And actually, that one's kind of fair. Build mode is a whole different beast in terms it's of what's very, actually happening. Yeah, there's a lot of extra stuff. But uh, so what that means is that in Glint, if you go start diving in to figure out how do we glue things into TypeScript, on the language server, there's just one spot, and it's relatively straightforward. For the CLI, there are, I think, four different places where we call into Correct. TypeScript, depending on yep. what flags you've passed into the CLI. Yep. And so what that means is that it may look like we're doing the same thing a bunch of different places. And in fact, we are, but we can't just not do that, because they're all subtly different in different ways. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of different sort of layers of abstraction in the compiler API in terms of how do you make TypeScript do stuff. At the lowest level is this ts.sys interface, SYS. And that really is meant to stand in for the platform that you're operating on. So it has a default implementation that generally just calls through to nodes OS operations. So this is going to be stuff like mostly dealing with the file system, but also things like, OK, how do we, like, what is the standard line banning on this platform and things like that. Right. And so if you access, like, I think it's just lowercase sys, if you import that from TypeScript, you get the default implementation of read file and watch file and read directory and all of these different things. But all of the compiler APIs don't assume any of that. They instead accept a system object as part of their sort of bootstrapping process. Mm -hmm. And so that's how, for instance, the TypeScript Playground works in your browser, is they've provided custom implementations of a bunch of those hooks that don't try and talk to a real file system because there isn't one of those. At a level above that are all of the different hosts. TypeScript has this notion of a host. And that is a thing that sits kind of in between the various invocations of the compiler and that right. system API. And so if the system API is really dealing with low-level things like, how do I read a file? How do I list the contents of a directory? The host API tends to be one step up from that. That's going to be things like, how do I resolve an import of a particular module path and things like that? And the, the point of the host is to really sort of abstract away all of the things that are not TypeScript from all of the things that are. And so when you're typed, and that sounds silly, but like when you're when TypeScript is going through and actually checking the types for a file, 
the bulk of what's going on there is just, okay, this is the TypeScript type system. It works a specific way. It is what it is. Yeah. But depending on what kind of bundler you're using or not using, whether you're operating in Node or Dino or the browser or whatever, the semantics of things like imports, and among other things, can be very different. Like and say so, you had to import things that didn't end in .ts? Who would do that? <laughs> um, so the host is really the thing that, on top of this, these system level operations, provides the, the semantics of the environment that you're operating in. And so when we go to talk to TypeScript, when we want to plug Glint into it, we provide our own custom implementations of a bunch of these hooks at both the system and the host layer. And that, I guess, is where it makes sense for us to kind of jump in and look at what we're doing today. Yeah, and, and we should be really clear as we are about to look at code that may, if you haven't actually looked at the TypeScript compiler API and the way that literally everybody does this, uh, including, as Dan just said, TypeScript itself. This is the intended mode for extending and altering the behavior of the TypeScript compiler. Uh, you could sum it up as monkey patch all the things. Uh, that's, that's how TypeScript expects and wants you to do this, which is, you know, a little strange seeming in some ways. But it does actually work pretty straightforwardly. So here we go. Yep. And it's worth calling out, there's a series of wiki pages on the TypeScript repo in GitHub that talks through not all of this in super great detail, but gives a lot of high-level examples of how you instantiate a host. And then if you feel like it, maybe just override a few methods on it by using standard JavaScript assignment. So we'll see a lot of that as we dig around. Uh, so we left off last time, we had gone through all of the transform stuff, and we have this rewrite module, which, as you'll recall, takes some amount of input in the form of a script and a template, and then gives us back transform TypeScript that represents that template, along with a bunch of sort of metadata about how that maps between what we have and what the original source was. What we're going to talk through today is what we do that ends up calling this, essentially. So let's for lack of a better idea, let's just jump into the CLI. So this index file is what gets invoked when you run Glint at the command line. And so we do a bunch of argument parsing. It's not very exciting. It mostly re-implements TypeScript's argument parsing as best as we can, except they have a custom argument parser. And so it's, it's extra fun to try to make sure that our behavior matches theirs. <laughs> Right. So you'll notice that there are a bunch of flags that TypeScript supports that we don't. And the general advice we give you on those is just set it in your TS config. We don't want to support it from the command line because the interwoven mess of all of that stuff is its own maintenance nightmare. So we have some stuff to spit things out to the file system. That's not really worth diving in on. And then actually the same as TSC, we have to immediately check, did you use the build flag? <laughs> And I know, at least early on, this may still be true. You had to literally specify build as the very first flag you passed to TSC, or it would yell at you in a board. Um, mm. They may have changed that now so that it's treated a little bit more like a standard flag, but it really is a huge fork in the road. And there's no mm. point in doing any other work until we've decided, is this build mode or is it not? Um, that's the actual differences between build mode and a standard TypeScript invocation are complicated. But the gist is that. Yeah. Normally, you're just saying, here's a TS config, follow it through, read whatever files you find, and type check them. Build is for when you have a whole sort of constellation of interrelated TypeScript projects. And so you're running TypeScript once, but it's actually operating against a bunch of separate projects that may or may not reference each other and need to be built in order. So we immediately are just pulling things out of the past in args. We're checking if we're in incremental mode. And then we call find TypeScript. And so this is a key piece of Glint, is we don't bundle our own copy of TypeScript. Mm -hmm. We always require that you have your own copy present in your project. This means that you're going to get the same results as you would if you just invoked TSC in terms of what features are supported, what syntax is going to work, what's not, that kind of thing. 
And if we dip, drill in on this, we're really just like, mm, let's go look for it in the package or let's look for it from wherever we're being resolved from. If not, this is not very exciting. I'm going to skip past it. Uh, we make sure that it's there. We make sure that it has a right version. And if it doesn't, we abort and say, hey, upgrade TypeScript. And then really the interesting bit here is one, two, three. Yeah, I was right, four. We have four different yep. functions that we might call depending on whether you're doing a watched build, a regular build, a watch check, or a regular check. And they're all going to look kind of similar. We'll mm -hmm. dive into just a strip standard check to start with. Check. So yes, it is. Oh, I should jump back. We somewhere uh, here, before we did that, we called this load config. So this is what goes, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have to click through several things here. But at the end of the day, what it's doing is looking for a TS config file, looking to see if it has Glint configuration in it, and if so, instantiating a Glint config object. This is mostly a fancy wrapper around what environments have you configured, as well as a couple of other checks like, do we care about standalone templates? What directory are we operating in? Where did this config file come from? Things like that. Right. Uh, let's go over here. Oh, that fixed it. And it wasn't Glint. That was regular TypeScript that was giving that. <laughs> we are better in some yeah. ways at Turns noticing file system changes. Yeah. So anyway, um, we go back to where we were. Mm -hmm. We've loaded our configuration. We do a little bit of looking at the options that we have to we have to play some games with okay what are the options you have in your ts config what are your options that you mm -hmm. passed as flags how do those things interact some things imply others this is all stuff that typescript itself does internally and we have to just sort of emulate here which is another reason that we don't keep adding more flags because everyone we add sort of blows out exponentially the number of cases we have to look for yeah so finally we know what our options are we know what our config is we can dive in and say perform check so previously, we parsed tsconfig just to get the Glint stuff out of it. When TypeScript parses tsconfig, it actually pulls it into a parsed like AST as it would for mm -hmm. a TS file. And so we basically re-execute that and create a compiler host. We talked about our hosts game. Uh, if we look here, this takes TypeScript, compiler options, and a transform manager, which we'll come back to, and then as I said, there's one version of the compiler host if we're in incremental mode. There's a different version if we're not. And now we do this fun stuff that kind of just bash. looks like we're assigning on top of methods, but that <laughs> is what we're doing. Um, <laughs> it looks like that's what we're doing because that's what we're doing. Exactly. And so here, where you can here you can see we're saying okay, instead of whatever your default read file implementation is, we're going to read the transformed version of that file. Mm -hmm. Whatever you would do by default when you're reading directories, never mind. Do this instead. Um, this one is not yellow because I'm on a version of TypeScript locally that doesn't have this hook yet. But this is what allows you to, as Chris alluded to earlier, import things that end in, for instance, .gts. Mm -hmm. And if we jump back up, so we have our compiler host. We build a formatter. This is not very exciting. It just we once again have to make a format diagnostic host, which has a very small API but it does care about things like what is the native new line. Mm -hmm. And then we, this ultimately just calls through to a standard formatting method that TypeScript itself has. And once again, we need to check incremental because there's incremental program versus regular program. And finally, we call create program, and then we pull diagnostics out. We yeah. call emit, which worth, is what we'll make. Worth reiterating, these are the TypeScript APIs. Create program is TypeScript's create incremental or non-incremental program. And we're just calling it with what, what should you be looking at, and then let's emit it. Let's collect diagnostics and then go. Yep. And so emit is both what does a lot of the type checking as well as what produces like DTS files and things mm -hmm. like that on disk. Um, in normal transpilation mode, this would also be what produced .js files, but we go out of our way not to allow that for Glint because the JavaScript that would be produced there would look like that nasty IR that we showed in the editor a couple episodes back. Gamma, Kai, wee! <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so we get all of our diagnostics out, but again, those are in terms of the 
transformed Gamma Chi We source. So we write those <laughs> back to uh, something that's reasonable and in terms of handlebars, and then we spit them out. And if there were any errors, then we exit with code one. Otherwise, we exit with code zero. And you can see collecting diagnostics is just going through and saying, OK, what are our syntactic mm -hmm. issues? Did we run into anything during the transform process? What are the semantic issues? And if we're in declaration mode, there's a whole extra set of errors you might see. So we also need to check for those. And we can sort of gloss through quickly. If I can go back far enough, like perform watch, it's going to look very similar. We build a diagnostic formatter. We make a host. We override that thing. And here we just call create watch program because this thing never exits until you're done. And so we just sort of hand off control of everything to TypeScript at this point, and it clears the screen and prints out diagnostics and so on. Um, build and build watch look similar. They're just a little bit more of a pain to set up because they have to go hunt for other projects. But at the end of the day, it's the exact same pattern that you're seeing, just set up slightly differently. All oh, right, and builders have clean mode, which is third so fun thing. <laughs> it's very helpful because caching is hard, but also it means that the invocation is extra special because right. it's not a subcommand, it's a flag that allows another flag if it's passed. And then it goes and does nice things for you, but has to follow all the same kinds of rules, all the same kinds of lookups, etc. Yep. So that's the whirlwind tour of how do you run the TypeScript compiler in various configurations. And I pointed out where we're overriding things like, how do we look at the file system? How do we resolve imports and things like that? But I keep glossing over this transform manager. This is where the heart of pretty much everything comes together. This is what ties in mm -hmm. TypeScript to all of our transform process and pretty much everything else in between. And we may have seen this a little bit um, in the past as we were jumping around, but today will be the day that we actually talk about what's happening here. Let's actually immediately jump past this to document cache. The so document cache is fairly simple. I say that as I scroll through about 200 Scrolls lines. Scrolls for a couple hundred lines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's lots of comments. It's fine. Um, this is essentially a read-through cache for what's on the file system. But we need to keep track of a couple of key pieces of information here. In particular, as I alluded to last time, the fact that standalone templates exist and may be associated with a backing class is nightmarish for us because it means that we need to present a single file to TypeScript and account for the fact that either one of those things changing is a change from TypeScript perspective to this unified file. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we're doing in here is saying, OK, where does the companion document for this thing live? <laughs> like, if it's a template, where is its backing class? If it's a backing class, where is its template? We also track things like there's a notion of a, yeah, here, a version. This comes up, I think, only for the language server. I don't think the CLI deals in this. But um, mm -hmm. anytime either one changes, either on disk or in the editor, we need to bump the version in a way that will bump it for both, such that when TypeScript is going through and revalidating whether documents have changed, it will see that. And so all this really is is a fancy way of avoiding hitting the file system when we don't need to because nothing has changed and making sure that we associate these sort of joint pairs of files together where appropriate. Um, the rest of it is really just sort of like playing a guessing game of, OK, you tried to import from slash foo. Is that foo.hbs or foo.ts or foo.gts and so on? And you'll see we there is in a future world where everything is going through TypeScript's module resolution bundler and using the uh, or module resolution node next or something. Basically, in a world where everything's actually stripped to ESM and you're actually importing from, and folks in the Ember Tools team just implemented this for add ons where you implement from .gts files, and Dan made that work this week in Glint itself, so that you type import foo from foo.gts, and you're not doing that kind of lookup. Some of this will get a lot simpler, notionally, eventually. That could be a few years, uh, just realistically. <laughs> but as we get to a point where specifiers for modules are all well specified that way and explicit, it's a little annoying because you have to actually write 
from .ts or from .gts or whatever. But the result of it is actually very helpful for tools because they don't have to play these guessing games anymore. And in sufficiently large projects, these guessing games, both inside Glint and inside TypeScript, can be very expensive. Uh, For example, I was doing some analysis with the TypeScript team on the big app for LinkedIn, which has millions of lines of code and tens of thousands of files in it that it has to check, and so it needs to go check when Glint is enabled, something like nine different possible file extensions for every single file that it might be looking up. And that problem will just go away as we move to a world where, you know, you actually have to use the correct module specifier. But for today, check HBS and check JS and check TS and check GTS and check GJS and check whether that's at foo slash index slash all of those or just foo dot all of it. It's a lot. But that's the kind of stuff we have to jump through and that TypeScript itself has to jump through because bundlers and Node and everything else. Yeah. And as long as we're on the topic of expensive guessing games, (laughs) I think it's a good opportunity to talk through the last bits of the environment API that we haven't looked at Mm. yet. So let's... Yes. So... We've talked a lot about how the environment sets up. Okay, these tags you import represent templates with this sort of configuration in terms of globals and special forms and stuff. But as I keep complaining about, standalone templates bring their own whole set of extra things we have to worry about. And in particular, that means that we need to, for any given file in your project, if you have standalone templates enabled, we have to go hunt around and see, does this TS file also have a template associated with it? And to be able to answer that question, we need to ask the environment about how does this association work? So if we jump over to Ember Loose, which I refused to look at last time, but today we have no choice. <laughs> you must. We want this. Um, and I mentioned <laughs> that we do a bunch of work to basically statically attempt the work that the resolver does at runtime. And this is exactly what you're seeing here. So we have a bunch of different extensions and patterns that we look for. And if we scroll down to I know he get possible script behind the curtain. <laughs> possible script pads. So what we're in is a situation where we have, for instance, opened a template in the editor, and we need to understand what the backing class, if any, for that template is. So this function is ultimately going to get called. And we're going to go through and say, OK, whatever the template extension is, First off, the thing that backs it is going to be .ts, or JS in the JS world. We'll get down there. And now we need to look, OK, does this look like a pod template? Is it, in other words, like is it template.hps? If so, then the thing might be component.ts, or it might be controller.ts, or it might be route.ts. Otherwise, if it's in template slash components, so this is like an old classic layout component template, mm-hmm. then we need to look in just slash components without templates and hopefully find a corresponding .ts file. Otherwise, if it's in templates, but it's not under slash components, then we need to check for <laughs> controllers or routes. And then, in fact, we need to do all of this twice because these things could be JS files instead. And that's fine. It's just a list of eight, 10 different places we might have to look. And of course, we have to be able to do the entire thing backwards. So when you open a script file, we need to know, does this have a template? Because otherwise, we're going to give you potentially bad information as we flag things like unused fields and the like. And so for here, we basically do what we just talked through above, but in reverse. Anywhere that you could have a template, we now need to look, or anywhere you have a controller, we need to look for a corresponding template or a route template and so on. And at the end of the day, we give you back a big long list. One thing to call out here that's especially fun is this defer to field. If you have both a route and a controller, when you open the route, we need to know that that is not the backing file for the template. Right. However, the controller if you don't have a controller, then the route is the backing file for the template. So, and when we say backing file, to be super clear, we don't mean it's the backing class. We mean it's the backing file, which provides information that we can pipe in, specifically what is the model, because that's what's going to be available. It will not be 
the same, like, it's not going to be, we don't incorrectly say, ah, it's the this or that, because that would be wrong, but this is always a controller of some variety, even if it's one that's synthesized at runtime, which, yes, that's what Ember does. Uh, but it is the context so that you get the model return from it. Here we are. So you can see here, if we wind up with a route as your backing file, then the template context is just bare controller plus model colon whatever the route would return. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the args, yeah, args are just model. Right. Shouldn't that have controller? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Not an issue for today. And so on. And so you can see I here. We've only hypothesized passing controller. We don't. Know. Okay. I see. Um, so here are the two declarations, and it's all of this sort of mechanical file system checking that I just walked through that mm. decides which of these two classes the template ends up being type checked in terms of. And so we can leave Ember loose again. Lovely. Just what I always Yay. like. Mm -hmm. And one further back. Yes. So once we've gone through and figured out for the template where its script might be or for the script where its template might be, we can go through whatever candidates the environment gave us back to. And if the corresponding document exists and one of the defer to options doesn't exist, then we found the <laughs> companion. Um, if we get through Otherwise, all okay. of this, mm -hmm. if we get through all of this and nothing matched, but it's still a template, then we basically say, OK, this template is its own backing file. Just It is a .ts file sitting wherever the template is. And this is also this degenerate case is also what component lo co-location gives you, is when they have the exact same name sitting next to each other, just with different extensions. So this is kind of our last, like, OK, if it's a template, great. If it's not a template, we get to the end, then this is actually the most common case, which is this is just a random JavaScript or TypeScript file that has no template associated. That's on easy mode. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's basically. Oh, yeah, we have this notion of a canonical path. Um, do we talk about why we have that? No, it's just the true path. We, we essentially need to, whether we're talking about a template or its backing class, when we're talking to TypeScript about these things, we need to always have a single answer of like, what is, what is the file that we're talking about here? And particularly in the language server, as you're potentially adding or deleting files, the answer to that question can change. And so we need mm -hmm. to keep track of not only what is the file on disk that we're talking about at the moment, be it the template or the backing file, but also like what is the sort of joint source of truth that we're talking about in terms of both of those things together. Uh, we also have this notion of speculative and stale, which sort of belong together. Um, Anytime we get asked about a file that we've never seen before, here we go. Um, there are many ways that this get document contents function might get called. When we get asked about it, this might be because TypeScript is just looking to see if it exists, or it might be because you've opened it in your editor, but it hasn't been saved yet, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so depending on whether it actually exists on disk or not, we consider it speculative or not. and also, correspondingly, we'll load it in from disk if necessary. Um, mainly, this allows us to know things like when the editor says, hey, we closed this file, does that mean we need to go back to reading it from disk, or does that mean the file is gone completely now? And the answer to that question depends on whether it was a speculative file to begin with. That, I think, is the whirlwind tour of the document cache. Mm -hmm. It really just exists to simplify the job of the transform manager, which we can now come back to. Um, we, as of like two days ago, also have a module resolution cache and a module resolution host. These things are not very excited. They're just sort of boilerplate TypeScript APIs yeah. for when you're going through the process of resolving modules and not repeating that work unnecessarily. Really, where the fun stuff is, let's, where is read transform file? Here we go. Um, yeah, easy peasy. It's only six lines. So this is the sort of this is our bread and butter. This is what we one of the things that we overrode over and over and over. So that mm. when TypeScript says I need to read my component.ts from disk, this is where we get a chance to say, actually, that doesn't look quite like what's on disk. <laughs> so 
the first thing we're going to do, and you'll see up and down in this file, basically everywhere, this is a method that we call a lot, is get transform info. This is where we're consulting all of our internals to say, what do we know about this? And this is, I think, probably the single longest method in this file. Mm -hmm. So we do a bunch. We pull a bunch of information out of ourself and the environment. We get the ID, which I think is essentially the path. Um, but again, it comes back to that like canonical path. Um, and then we keep a cache and say, hey, do we already know the answer to this? And if we do, and it's still the same version as it was the last time we asked this question, then we're done. We can skip a lot of work. Otherwise, we need to do some work, potentially. We need to do a lot of work, yeah. Right. So basically, we'll do this sort of the whirlwind version. If it's a script, and it is matched by the glint config. Um, so this means like if it is an extension that we understand and so on. If it exists in our document cache, then we pull out the contents, look for its companion, make sure we're talking in terms of the canonical path and not the specific one that was requested. Because again, you can open one or both of these things in your editor, but we need to make sure we're talking in terms of the source of truth that we have told TypeScript this is. Yep. Um, this is, we talked about, forget if it was last time or the previous time, we put together like a regular expression to very quickly check if it even looks like there might be an embedded template in there. Uh, and so this is where we actually run that check. It's, uh, yeah, you just say, okay, pull up the configuration for that extension. If it has a preprocess or a transform, then it definitely could have embedded templates because we don't even know what it looks like until we've run that. Otherwise we're checking like, does this thing look like it has an import for a tag we notice? HBS, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so if it might have embeds or we discovered a companion template, then we need to do work. So we construct our script from the canonical path that we were given. I was right, it is the script that we treat as the canonical path um, and whatever contents we loaded. If we found a template, then we ask for the document contents for that and use the template path. Otherwise we say undefined. So remember from before, we always pass in a script. We may pass in a standalone template and then we call rewrite module. So for this specific branch, we have officially made it from invoking the CLI to rewrite module to everything we talked about last time and right. the times before that. Otherwise, exciting. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we've gotten all the way through to that point. We've mm -hmm. start just to review everybody. We started with the CLI invocation and now we've gotten to rewrite module and you've seen rewrite module and you've seen all the things that rewrite module produces. So you can actually fit together now with these different pieces end to end one flow through the program. By all means, carry on, Dan. I just wanted to call out. That's actually a really big moment here. So, so if it's not a script or it's not included, interesting. I'm not going to question that right now. Um, why do we do that, I wonder? I don't know. Oh, wait. Ah, that's what we're checking. OK. Yeah. Mm. I'm still not sure I, Good. in principle, I wonder if this could be uh, wrapping this entire thing in a conditional. I think it is. If you look at which line. Oh, 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 yes. I am looking at the wrong else. You are exactly right. <laughs> yep. Okay. Got it. Correct. 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 Okay. Anyway, thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Good. I'm glad I'm not. So this was the, have we seen it before? Is it in the document cache? This else is, there was nothing in the document cache that looked like the thing we're being asked about. So we say, okay, if this is a synthesized module, which remember earlier, we said that there are cases where we are going to pretend that there's a TS file even when there isn't. Um, and this gets into things like when I just run glint at the command line, TypeScript is the thing that's doing all of the crawling of the file system to figure out what files are actually included there. We do override read directory. And the re part of the reason we do that is yeah. because if you just have a .hbs file, TypeScript is going to ignore that. It doesn't know what HBS is. It has a hard-coded notion of, here are the file extensions I could possibly care about, and that's not something we can change. So anywhere we see a .hbs file, we present that as, depending on your config, yeah. either a .ts or a .js file. Yeah. And so this is us doing that in reverse. We're saying, OK, like 
TypeScript is asking us about that thing we synthesized. What's the actual template path for it? Let's see if that's in our document cache. And also, is this synthesized file path the correct companion document for that? Mm -hmm. So like, is TS asking about something that in fact we have our true companion document for instead? But if the template exists and this is the companion document for it, then we're in that case that I talked about earlier where there is no actual script, but we need to have something to hand off as the baseline for all the work we're doing. So in this case, the answer is export nothing, which is enough to give TypeScript kind of a foothold for what is the script that we're talking about, as well as ensure it that we are treating this as a module and not a script where things are in global scope and behaviors get a little strange. And one note, uh, you said a couple times it, that we're asking, is this thing in our cache? But remember that it, for viewers, remember that it's a read-through cache. So this also handles the case where we haven't seen it the first time. Um, yes, correct. So like, if we, we know the answer, we can say, it yeah, that, is it on the file system? Cool, now we're going to keep it in our cache so we don't have to go look it up again unless something invalidates it. But if we haven't seen it, like if we've never asked for this before, the first thing we do is go check the file system per this bit right here. Right. So if there's something in the cache and it's not speculative, which we talked about earlier, would be only because like the editor has a file, but we've never seen it before, um, then we know the answer and we don't need to go to the file system at all. Otherwise, we do the whole song and dance where we figure out what all the possible paths it could live at is and go actually ask whether the file exists. And now we're to rewrite right. module for the standalone template case. We did it. Yay. We, yeah. We construct a cache entry so that we don't have to do all this work again unless the version changes. We stick it in there. And we are officially done. We have our transform info. It's going to take me a very long time to get back to where we got here from. <laughs> here we go. OK. So after doing all of that, or potentially doing none of that if we already knew the answer, mm -hmm. we can now say, if there's transform info and it contains a transformed module. So it's also possible that we cached the answer that there was no transform that happened. But if it happened, then we reform the transformed contents. So this is that string that we worked really, really hard to build. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, all we're doing in read transform file is handing off that string. Uh, otherwise, if there was no transform, then we just read straight through and say, OK, whatever's in that file is in that file. And this is the pattern that we'll see pretty much over and over throughout Transform Manager. Mm -hmm. We have things like file exists, which just goes straight through to document exists. We have read directory, which does exactly the thing I was talking about, where mm -hmm. we go take all the files we see that match extensions we know about and say, actually, we want to present these as the appropriate script path for TypeScript instead. The reason this is its own standalone method, aside from the fact that we call it a lot, is that we may care about things like, if you're in a JavaScript project, then we want to pretend that .hps files are .js files. If you're in a TypeScript project, we want to pretend they're .ts files, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about get modified time. It, it does what it sounds like. Yeah, it's, it's just it accounting for the fact that templates and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to account for the end time of both files. Right. And then we have rewrite diagnostic, which we've talked about in the abstract a lot. And we looked at mm -hmm. the implementation that we're calling through to here. This is doing the exact same thing we did before, where we're looking up the file we're being asked about, pulling the transform info, and assuming that it's reasonable, rewriting it. We also have to go through and check directives and say, oh, we had a diagnostic here. But in fact, we don't care about that because it was silenced or whatever else. Right. If you write glint ignore, glint expect error, then if there was an error there, OK, we're going to ignore it. But if there was, if we said glint expect error and there's no error there, then we need to do the same thing that TypeScript does, et cetera. Yeah, we have to create a diagnostic, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the transform manager. Which that really is it. That basically gives you the whole story for how the CLI works. Um, the language server works very similarly, except we do a lot more of this translation work um, yeah. because the LSP speaks a different language than TypeScript's language service actually does. We spend a lot of time converting like line and column offsets to just character offsets and things like that. But at the end of the day, if you understand the patterns we're doing here, where we're taking in input mm -hmm. in terms of just what we've presented to TypeScript and giving it back in terms of the original templates, 
the language server looks exactly the same. And we talked about this a little bit in the first episode as well, I think. Um, it's really just over and over. Uh, diagnostics is not a great example, but like completions, completion details, we're really, we call through to the TypeScript language server, we pull some stuff out, and then we play games where we convert things to <laughs> whatever the LSP wants rather than whatever data structures TypeScript itself right. uses. And the and other that, thing to maybe call out is the build path basically does the exact same thing. It's got this transform manager pool, which implements more or less the same interface uh, as transform manager does. It just has the ability itself to wrap up and say, I have a bunch of transform managers and I can delegate to the right one because you might have different configs. And so you need, for every project you're referencing, you need to make sure it's using its own specific local glint config if it's got one. So that's really all it does though. The rest of this is going to look exactly the same other than again, we're calling create solution builder host rather than one of the other create host invocations. And then we just invoke it. And so it's the same basic dance. It just has one additional layer of abstraction above the transform manager itself and everything else just continues to work the same way. It just says, as Dan has highlighted here, give me the manager for a given file name and use, if we've said, if we've overridden how it looks up whether files exist or not, use that. Otherwise, use the one from the root TS program that we passed in. So TSC that you get from the root. Boom, the end. And they all do the exact same thing. Yep. Getting that all wired up was annoying, but <laughs> <laughs> they all do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. That's basically the story of Glint, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting it wired up was annoying, but at the end, it all does the same thing. Yeah, that works. Perfect. So I think that's a good place to stop for today. Uh, maybe next time we can actually dig into some of the, the language server parts and if people have questions or whatnot, let us know. What else do you think we should cover before wrapping up this awesome little series we've been doing, Dan? I think the language server we should definitely hit. And in particular, we should look at how that how the sort of binding layer works of getting mm. from we have a generic language server to this is what TypeScript is doing. Yeah. It looks a lot like what we've seen, like we both said, um, but I think it's just worth walking through quickly. Beyond that, we have a couple of other packages we haven't really talked about. There's, oh, that's not a package. There we go. Um, <laughs> I think, well, there's the Glint extension itself. That's very boring. That really is just mm -hmm. setting up the language server, but we also have this type test package and we have the scripts package. Mm -hmm. If that's interesting to people, that may be worth diving into. Um, but both of those things are sort of ancillary to the core of the project. And yeah. I think they're pretty understandable on their own. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, I think if we can do a quick overview of the language server next time, and then assuming folks have time and interest in asking questions, we can maybe cover whatever right. else comes in. But I think we're right. in the home stretch at this point. Sweet. Well, now everybody knows how it works. So mission accomplished. <laughs> Yeah, the PRs will start rolling in. <laughs> we can hope. Thanks, Dan, <laughs> and thanks, everybody, for watching. If you liked this video, do actually do the thing that YouTubers tell you to do and like it and maybe subscribe. I plan to keep making, even once we finish this, I do plan to keep putting up kind of deep dive-ish things from time to time. This is my jam. So or, or you're never going to get, like, three-minute hot takes from me, more like 30-minute <laughs> cold takes. But if you like it, do those things. And thanks for watching.